This year is my 13th year of pretty extensive traveling with the goal of going out, seeing the world, and looking for the opportunities that we talk about as going where you're treated best. And over the last 13 years, seven of which I have been entirely out of the country I was born in, I have changed the way I travel, I've changed the way I look at travel, and in this video I'm going to share with you some of the things that I have changed in my personal travel habits over the years. Hey guys, I'm Andrew Henderson, and if you'd like to learn how Nomad Capitalist helps seven and eight figure entrepreneurs and investors go where they're treated best using the world as their oyster, uh, you can learn more about everything that we do at nomadcapitalist.com. Now, uh, over the last 13 years, I have started businesses, sold businesses, um, changed what I'm doing to the point where in late 2012, I decided uh, I'm getting out of everything I'm doing in the United States. Uh, I'm going to sell it all, sell the last business, sell the house, and basically bump my uh, what had become pretty extensive uh, travels uh, the majority of the months of the year into full-time nomadism and going and exploring all of the opportunities. And that's when I started nomadcapitalist.com as a blog to write about this stuff. Uh, and it evolved into what it is today. And so uh, it's fair to say that certainly I have grown as a person. I have... Uh, grown financially in this time and and through that process there have been some things that I've changed in the way that I travel uh, the first thing that has changed uh, is that I have reduced the amount of nomadism in my life now uh, I think that for a lot of folks it's important to go through the phases right I mean just as in life you don't start at 13 years old and become 80 years old overnight you go through you experience life you learn things you change you adjust your preferences change uh, I think for a lot of folks who are just starting out exploring the world at some pace whether it's one week per place one month per place or one quarter per place I think it's important people often come to me and they say Andrew I want to lower my taxes and I'll say great do you know where you want to go no okay check out these five places, pick one, we'll put your residence over here for now to make the tax plan work, uh, and then get back to me in six months or a year, or, you know, where do you want to live? So I'm not against nomadism, but as I have traveled more, I found that uh, I like to stay in certain places that I like. If you're running a, a large business, I think it's easier to be in places that are comfortable for you, that are known for you. Either they're a hub city, they're a base city where you actually live, or it's a focused city where you, you, um, you know your way around, okay? So that goes in line with uh, number two, which is I spend a lot more time in my own homes. And so I have gone on um, to buy properties all around the world in places that I like, and I have a list of places that I'm interested in potentially buying. Uh, I'm interested in checking out to potentially buy. Um, and really what I want to do is create my own network of places where I can go and stay and be comfortable and be productive and get work done. Uh, I do not want to be in one place all year long. I think Kuala Lumpur is great, Bogota is great, Tbilisi is great, Montenegro, we talk about a lot of different places, Mexico, there's, there are a lot of places and there are also uh, countries, you know, smaller cities. I've come to appreciate um, places that are a bit more rural for brief periods of time or, or maybe you want some skiing in your life in the winter or uh, you want a tropical island in your life, whatever. Uh, I'm on a mission to uh, assemble a collection of properties to where I can go. I can have the, the decorations that I want. Um, I can have everything the way I need it. And uh, I'm looking to do good deals that either lead to residence or citizenship or, or just a good investment. Okay? And we talked about that in a lot of other videos, but I'm spending a lot more time in my homes. I'm inc increasingly reducing the amount of number of hotel nights I spend in a year. So a couple years ago, I might have spent 225 nights a year in different hotels and I would own one or two or three properties and I wouldn't really spend that much time there. Now I'm really increasing the uh, time that I spend in homes that I own uh, where I have control over my environment. And, and to the first point, what I'm also doing is a lot more ABA travel rather than A B C A or A B C D, right? So uh, if I'm in Kuala Lumpur and I want to go to Dubai, I will go 
Then I'll go to Dubai. I'll take my carry-on suitcase or maybe my checked luggage. I'll take my uh, Kuala Lumpur toiletry bag and I will go off to Dubai and then come back. Uh, I don't really do a lot of, um, hey, uh, we got to go back to Tbilisi for the summer. And so on the way is Dubai. We wanted to go there for four days. I don't really do that because one of the things that I've changed is I don't like to drag stuff around with me. Uh, I just, my ideal uh, life is I take a laptop bag with me. Uh, and so I think that as you do this more and more, you know, uh, point number three is I try and fly business class more often. Certainly when I was you know, 23 years old, I wasn't doing that very much. I had a ton of miles and I was hoarding them by flying the cheapest class possible. I'd always fly economy, even though I had millions of miles at one point because uh, I wanted to make them last longer. Uh, but even if you fly business class, oh, you get, you know, two 32 kilo bags. You know, it's, it's like uh, that meme saying uh, you're not wealthy until you can fly on a private jet without taking a photo. Uh, <laughs> for me, it's been, you know, you're not, you haven't totally arrived until you can fly business class without extracting, you know, every, uh, every perk and every benefit. Okay. Uh, I do fly business class when possible. There are certain routes where it just doesn't make sense. I don't spend much time in Western Europe. But, you know, if you're flying from London to, you know, Rome, I wouldn't bother, right? Because it's just ridiculous. Um, in fact, you know, sometimes I'll fly, you know, you'd be flying Tbilisi to Istanbul and then to Kuala Lumpur. And, you know, you wouldn't fly Tbilisi to Istanbul in business class generally. Um, I guess I can afford to do so, but it's just, you know, paying five times the price for this seat that just is a little bit wider for an hour. I generally don't do it. Now, on the other hand, I've also said, I'm not going to fly in low-cast airlines. That's more of a matter of I've seen uh, Jetstar delaying my flight for eight hours. One time I remember I was in Vietnam. Uh, I was flying from Da Nang to uh, Ho Chi Minh City, and it was like 8 o'clock at night. And my Jetstar flight that I'd booked for really cheap was uh, delayed till something like 4.30 in the morning. And I walked up to Vietnam Airways, a real airline, and I said, you know, you have a flight half an hour later. Can I, can I take it? They said, yeah, we only have business class. It's 125 bucks. And so, you know, for an hour, for 125 bucks, the, the money was just about bypassing the hassle. I try and avoid hassles now. Business class generally helps me avoid hassles because you often get uh, priority lines on arrival. Sometimes you get priority lines when you're going. I'm not in this camp that says business class is some be all end all. It's so amazing. You know, the service is a little better. The food's a little better. Uh, for me, it's really about avoiding hassles. And so what I've learned doing so much travel is I just want to avoid hassles. I don't want to be stuck in long lines. I want someone to care if there's a problem. I want to have some kind of level of, of priority in case I need some help with something. And if I can get a little comfort out of the deal, all the better. The fourth thing that I've stopped doing, though, along those lines is I've really stopped prioritizing uh, lounge access. Again, um, if you're flying business class through you know, Istanbul, for example, great lounge. Uh, Qatar, great lounge. Uh, Dubai, I've been in the first class Emirates lounge. Yeah, it's nice. I mean, okay, it is undoubtedly nice. I don't know, I find Dubai and I find Emirates uh, as, a, as an airport a little bit uh, overrated. Uh, but there are some absolutely great lounges. There are also a lot of lounges that are bad. And so the reason is, in my mind, anyone with a credit card now can get access to the lounge with a priority pass or uh, even with an airline credit card, you can get access to the, uh, to the lounge for that airline. And so the lounge experience to me has been greatly devalued. I'm not saying I won't go, um, but again, it's a situation where some of the lounges I go to in some of these, you know, lower tier cities that aren't London or Singapore or, or Hong Kong or whatever, the lounges are kind of bad, right? Um, and so actually I started doing something recently where if I'm flying out of my hub airport, like I'm flying from Kuala Lumpur to, I recently flew to Myanmar, uh, flying out of Kuala Lumpur with, a, with, they've got a pretty good lounge actually, uh, in business class is great. Flying back when you get the same lounge you get with every credit card and it's not that good and they don't have priority boarding and there's no, extra, there's no special line, it's, it's not even really worth it. Um, but lounges for sure become so, um, available to everyone. And, you know, it's not a thing about snobbery. It's just if it's available to everyone, it's really available to no one. The same thing goes for point number five, uh, miles. Uh, for me, miles have been devalued. They're difficult to use. It's often a pain. Uh, I just don't bother so much anymore. If I accumulate miles, like with an American Express card, I'll, I'll accumulate points. I'll figure out how to spend them eventually. If I accumulate miles on a certain airline, 
Okay, I'll do that. I'll put a little bit of effort into, all right, I'm flying on the Star Alliance. Uh, here's my Star Alliance airline. I'm flying on One World. I think I'm still crediting to America. I have American and British because um, they still have the best ratios. But uh, I don't put that much effort in. And I also don't really focus too much on uh, redemption values. We've got a credit card um, that gets us hotel points. And you can, you can move the hotel points into airline miles. Um, and so we'll do that sometimes. Uh, but, you know, if I can burn the points, I'm not going to be obsessed with, you know, can I get 1.4 cents per point? This is, this is only 0.9 cents per point. Uh, for me, travel, you know, and the loyalty and all these little perks that have been made available to so many people with a $95 credit card has really devalued it. It's not worth it. My focus on travel now is how do I avoid hassle? How do I avoid chaos? How do I bring about calm in my travel experience? Because, you know, for me, there's a difference between, you know, I work in an office in London and, hey, let's take our two-week holiday and let's go to Mauritius. There's a difference between that and the experience of travel there, which is what I started with. The, that's the feeling I had 13 years ago when I started traveling. Now, at a certain point, you've been doing this long enough, it's just like, I want to get from point A to B. I don't want someone to be snarly. Uh, I don't want my bag to get lost. Uh, I don't you know, want to have any problems. That's the thing that I think, um, as you continue your nomad capitalist journey, you'll increasingly find, uh, is just seek calm. And a lot of these things, for me, have become distractions. A lot of the perks, a lot of the shiny objects have really become distractions. Uh, that's how I've changed travel. I'm curious to hear your comments on this. I know some of you really enjoy collecting your miles, and I know occasionally when I'm working with someone and I tell them, hey, if you want to be uh, not paying tax in your home country, you got to cancel that miles card. I know sometimes that the real sticking point for folks is, is not being able to earn their miles. Even if they save 40% on their taxes, um, miles are sometimes a sticking point. Okay. Um, so I know that some of you may have different opinions. I'd like to hear that in the comments. For me, it's all about calm. It's all about simplicity. It's all about just getting to the destination without distractions. How can Nomad Capitalist help you? Four ways. Number one, subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell to make sure you get our new video every day. Number two, get a copy of Nomad Capitalist, the book. You'll learn a lot of my personal experiences over a dozen years of studying this stuff, as well as exactly some of the strategies that you can use to build your nomadic capitalist plan. Number three, if you're not sure where to start, but you want to come and learn from my team and I, you want to come and mingle with like-minded people, learn more about our live conference, Nomad Capitalist Live. It's coming up soon. And number four, if you want some help right now because you've got a burning issue, you need something solved, you want to lower your taxes, get a second passport, or build the Nomad Capitalist lifestyle of your dreams, go to nomadcapitalist.com and click on Become a Client.